guys. I gotta make sure that the uh, videos are gonna play when we swap over. Um, but while we're just staring at that image, I'll say, hi, I'm Alex. I run a, uh, basically an XR studio and consultancy here in New York City called Agile Lens. And I've been building uh, virtual reality experiences for about five years. I also have backgrounds in architecture and theater going on about 15 years. So I'm hoping tonight this is kind of a raw, newish presentation. I'm not the kind of guy who's gonna be like, ah, I did this thing over total chaos, I'm just gonna do it again here. This is like a fresh, brand new presentation, and you guys are gonna see the rawness of it like a, like a new stand-up set, but fewer laughs. And let's see how this, yeah, great, right, that's working, cool. And uh, what I'm hoping to do tonight is kind of distill some of my knowledge, I hope it's knowledge, over the past few years. All right. Feels like a stand-up set. Um, into what it means to craft a meaningful and immersive environment. I've seen a lot of bad VR experience, as I'm sure many of you have. Who has seen a bad VR experience before? Yeah, there's some terrible ones. And I'm hoping, um, kind of with an eye towards architecture, architecture visualization, um, as well as something that's been catching, catching my fancy quite a bit lately, the future of virtual architecture environments that are never going to be built, and always intended to stay as virtual environments, what does it mean to craft meaningful ones that actually communicate and inspire and provide awe in the best possible way? And um, should have stayed on this slide for a bit. This is kind of me in a nutshell. Theaters and visualization and immersive design and hands coming out like a creepy, shining thing. Um, and so the way I got started in virtual reality was in crafting theaters. I used to work for a company called Fisher Dax Associates, which designs exclusively theaters all over the world. And we started using virtual reality in 2013 as a way to check sight lines and toggle different design options. And the first project we did VR on was this one. And it was really lovely. It had exactly the effect we were hoping for, where everyone felt like they had a better understanding of the state of the design. They could pop in a VR headset, and it was like they were there. And we could get past a lot of those communication issues that can happen sometimes if you're trying to show a plan or a section to someone who doesn't understand how to read a plan or a section, right? And uh, I'll just go through a few projects really quick, then we're going to get into the meat of what I'm calling tonight the six lessons of immersive environment design. That's our, our early, you know, immersive project there, you can see how it translates to the render. <laughs> Once we did a theater, we thought it'd be really, oh, come on videos, don't stop playing now. Oh, come on, come on, this is gonna take a second. Once we got started with architecture, then it was only a little hop, skip, and jump over to making sure that we could actually do other things as well. Let me try to do this one-handed. Uh, this was a production of Kenneth Branagh's Macbeth at the Park Avenue Armory. Here's what I gotta do, guys. I gotta exit and go back in. But you see what that looks like. Keep that in mind while I'm closing and reopening. <laughs> and at uh, the Park Avenue Armory, which is an entire New York City block, it's an incredible space. It used to be a drill hall for the War of 1812. Um, we did a number of projects in there. Here we go, ready? Three, two, one. It plays now, cool. We did it. Fantastic. So, moving right along with this silly little video that's from 2014. Uh, it's just a little bit of a sense of how we were using the, the very first Oculus Rift to kind of understand spaces and just iterate really quickly, look at different design options, and decide what was best. Another project really quick with FX Collaborative, who we share a building with. They did the Statue of Liberty Museum, which recently opened, those are photos, and this was a great way toward the end of the process just to see what it would actually be like, and also the Historical Society of Liberty Island could use this to give people a sense of what it's like to actually be in the space. <laughs> we could also have a little site model there, which is cool, just by shrinking the whole thing down. And they actually do sell these little, you know, Statue of Liberty statues, so we could have a, an immersive gift shop. Fantastic. Here's a few slides that look very nice, but I'm going to talk about them in a totally different way from how I used to. Because when I used to talk to architects, uh, people in visualization, I'd be like, hey guys, you're all afraid of VR. Don't be afraid. It's really simple. You guys already know how to model and texture and light, and you know how to do renders. And if you want to do a VR experience, then the first step is you just got to do a little bit more of that and think about the areas that aren't in your immediate frame. And once you do that, wow, you hit a couple switches in V-Ray or Corona, and you have a 360 panorama. No problem. And I can give you a tutorial. It's really simple. It's like five steps. And then if you want to go further and then have a fully navigable experience where you can walk around and interact with things, it's just more modeling and textures and lighting. And now you can walk around, and it's great. And it's really not so hard. And then once you've done all that, you can output to 2D versions and a smartphone version and have all these different ways to interact with it. And it's really simple. And 
I love doing this to my own slide. Like, <laughs> um, and what I, I started to realize was that's true to a certain extent, but it's very misleading because it leaves out all the craft that goes into making an experience that really communicates well what you're trying to do. Because it's so different to be inside a virtual reality experience than it is to look at a render where you have so much more control over what the uh, user is taking in. Just a little pulse there. So what I like to uh, start with thinking about this in terms of an analogy is the early days of film. Film, of course, has been along for, uh, around for a very long time. And back in 1878, we had a film of a horse running. And I think this is a great analogy for virtual technologies because this was not necessarily something you'd call art. It might be an ancient version of what we today would call a tech demo. Like, it does one thing very well. There's something pragmatic about it. Uh, before this movie, we never knew for sure that when a horse runs, all of its feet leave the ground. And that was kind of a fun fact, and everyone was like, that's great. Uh, but it wasn't necessarily art. And so when you think about how long it took for the language of cinema to develop, um, with cuts and wide shots and close-ups and lighting and a lot of the stuff Nikos talked about last month, um, that took a while. And we now have an eye that can look at a crazy action sequence, and there's a little bit of a cognitive load to it, but we can kind of follow what's going on. And if you show something like this to someone from the early 1900s, they'd be so confused, and not just because of the cars and all the technology that doesn't exist, but because they, they hadn't yet been trained to read um, the cinematic language in the way that we have. Same thing as, as reading um, text. Um, though, that being said, I don't want to give the impression that it's taken this long for the cinematic language to develop, because for those of you who know, someone shout out, who made Battleship Potemkin? Thank you, yes. <laughs> someone just say Potemkin. <laughs> uh, uh, just I, the idea of someone naming a movie after themselves, like the battleship Spielberg, is great. Um, but you know, as early as 1926, almost 100 years ago, you know, uh, Eisenstein was pioneering montage and communicating a lot of information through cuts. And so there is an opportunity very early on in, in a technological cycle to start to develop best practices and a foundation that everyone else can build off of. And when I think about where we are right now in the, what will one day be the long history of spatial computing, I like to use this wonderful diagram, so here's like, you know, the 1980s, and here's 2100. You know, I feel like we're kind of about there. We're, we're, we're starting to like barely mass things in and think about what it could be. Uh, but there's nothing really being generated yet, in my humble opinion, that really qualifies as art that is, is truly specific to this medium. There, there's some standout examples, but I think we're at a time when there, it's possible to start to develop that Eisensteinian language that will start to shape the future of immersive experiences, but it's a whole different ballgame. And so the way I'm gonna talk about this a little bit is framing it through these lenses that, that I've come to uh, create my experiences through. So background in architecture, background in theater, and then yeah, for these past five years doing a lot of virtual reality work. So six lessons, and the first lesson that I find, and all these lessons are, are pitfalls, they're places where I see people making big mistakes. So lesson one is who's your audience, and what do you need to experience? And I want you to notice I'm using the word experience, not tell. In virtual reality, for example, you can't really tell someone something because it is up to them to move through the experience and uh, have that information communicated to them on their own. It's a little bit like Inception, like you can't just tell someone, have this idea, uh, they need to kind of come up with it on their own. So a big part of creating a good virtual reality experience is to create the space for them to craft their own narrative as opposed to you just feeding them one. And so once you start to think about um, who your audience is gonna be and what you're trying to uh, communicate to them and how they'll experience that on their own, that can start to guide you towards what kind of platform you're going to be using and whether it's going to be something that's very tried and true and working with existing technologies and workflows or if it's a little bit more pioneering, a little bit risky. And uh, this is a chart that we often use when starting with a new client to just kind of gauge what their, their risk level is, so to speak. Because there's a lot of things you can do in virtual reality that you can't do in traditional mediums of representation. One is uh, movement, and that's a big part of architecture, of course, is actually moving through a space and seeing what it actually feels like to go from point A to point B. So this is just a simple sketch that's starting to think about um, what the progression of someone moving through the space might be, and you can iterate on this very quickly and actually put people into it and see, you know, if you remove all the lines, like how do they move through the space naturally? And uh, one example of us doing this was working on a hospital project where that's a sink, and we were just very quickly prototyping some of the stuff that was going to be an operating room. And in this case, we were able to get one of the users, 
a surgeon who's actually going to be using this OR once the building is completed. And we could let them actually start to move around these big blobby sketches of an operating table and other kinds of equipment to start to think ergonomically about what they wanted to have in close proximity to them. And I want you to notice, of course, that this is not photorealistic by any stretch of the imagination. This was like a bare minimum workshop tool so that spatially we could start to think about how uh, we might want to lay out how this room is going to operate. In this case, you know, there's the one piece of equipment they wanted more precisely, so we got a nice model of that. And you put all that together in um, a way that starts to communicate some ideas about the space that you otherwise could not do through other mediums, very specific to virtual reality. Lesson two is once you've decided on a platform and you know how you're going to be creating this experience, is thinking very hard about what the strengths and weaknesses of that particular platform are and playing to those. So an example of that is um, we've been doing some theater experiments. Uh, this is an improv troupe. Uh, we were called Live in Plastic Land. We work with New York City actors. And we've been putting on these improv shows over the past year that are very much trying to take advantage of being in a virtual reality headset with full body tracking. And what are some of the advantages of being in this platform? Well, you can look any way you want. There's plenty of avatars to choose from. And a costume change is basically going backstage and clicking on a new character. You can change your scale. You can fly. And when you think about all of the thought that can go into um, an improv performer as they're crafting the narrative <laughs> in real time, there's a lot of amazing things that can happen that are specific to this media. Here's the other thing. One of the limitations of VR is sometimes there's glitches. And if you're doing Shakespeare and suddenly Hamlet's arm just starts like hitting someone, it's hard to recover from that. But an improv performer can play off that and make it part of the show. So that's one of the reasons we've been doing these improv comedy shows. And that's been a lot of fun. Um, similarly, so uh, Kevin Lapson, who's right there, is uh, part of both the last slide and this one, and we did this production of uh, That Kind of Guy. The last thing was a live performance. This is a standalone piece where we took a piece done by Josie Simple and had it in Magic Leap. And of course, Magic Leap, for those who don't know, is augmented reality, and in augmented reality, you have a limited field of view. So if you're going to do a theater piece and something with a limited field of view, maybe a way to play to the strengths of that is to actually shrink down the actor so they're only about four inches high, and that way you can see everything they're doing, and you have this kind of little tabletop theater experience. Also, Magic Leap allows for hand interaction, so we're not going to have people use a controller. We're going to let them use their hands to actually interact and play with the piece as it goes on and have some different branching narratives. This is also an Easter egg where uh, they can pop up behind you and scare the bejesus out of you. It's really great. And that's here, too, if no one wants to try it. Um, next up, Intel, we did a project for with uh, Glimpse Group where they were like, hey, we want to show people how amazing our CPU is for virtual reality. Uh, for those who don't know, CPU, not that important in virtual reality. But again, we know the platform, we know what the client wants, and so, okay, what's useful for CPU inside VR? Uh, particle effects, um, animations, and so we did you know, 2,500 animated people, we had fireworks, we had all these other things that were very specific to what the client was asking for. Uh, we also had it set up so you could do V-Ray renders in here using the CPU, so very targeted. Um, one more example of augmented reality and Magic Leap. This was a project um, still up in Olana right now in Hudson, New York, where you can move through the actual historic home here and have this experience where nature is kind of invading the space. So, of course, a great thing about augmented reality as opposed to virtual reality is it's site-specific. It's actually interactive with what you see right in front of you. Last one I'm showing here is that sometimes um, a fully navigable experience where you move around isn't actually what you need. And you can simplify a lot by just doing panoramas. So in this case, I still can't talk about who this client is even though it's been many years. We realized that the client really only needed to see what this view was going to be just coming off the elevator. It was that moment right when you see the space that they cared about. And so we could iterate very quickly from a sketch to a massing model to different variations on the materials. And then eventually, yes, later they wanted to play with like moving the furniture around. But we got 90% of where we wanted to just through a few panoramas, and sometimes that's all you need. And that brings us to lesson three, which is only present what you need to. And I see this all the time. People say, oh, I have a huge Revit model. I have the entire project. And that can be a nightmare for everyone involved, because it's really hard to, I'll uh, back there for a second, it's really hard to optimize that much. And you're going to overwhelm the person you're putting into there. Again, cognitive load where there's too much to see, and you're not guiding them with what's important. Also, if you try to go too photorealistic too fast, that's a problem. And so here's a project that I'll be bringing up a lot through the rest of my presentation because what's cool about this project, the Rice University Music and Performing Arts Center, currently under construction, is we started using virtual reality at the very beginning of the project design phase. And so here we are at the concept stage, and you'll notice we've got no lights, no materials, really simple colors. This is very diagrammatic, intentionally so. That way we could focus on what we cared about at this point, which was comparing the blue option and the green option and talking about what felt better. 
for the design moving forward. And you can talk about how something feels in virtual reality in a way that is much more difficult using um, any other medium. And so from there, um, we actually were able to make some really good decisions that were foundational to the project moving forward. Another example of this, and uh, for this one, it's, it's about who your audience is because we had a lot of trouble for the shed over at Hudson Yards um, with this grid system up here. It was very custom, and we were specking with Fisher Dax Associates the equipment that was going to go up there. And so I did a, a, a section box around the Revit model. This wasn't going to be ever shown to the public, never to the public. But uh, for the internal design team, we wanted to get a sense of where we could fit equipment. So we knew some equipment needed four feet of clearance, some needed seven feet of clearance. And so what do you do? You take a four foot stick and a seven foot stick, parent it to the player object, and you can move around and answer 90% of your questions in that kind of way. So sometimes this is all you need. Um, there's a thought that uh, photorealism is a big part of virtual reality, and 90% of the time, it, if anything, um, distracts people by having too much too quick. I really like that we call it uh, an immersive experience because the first thing people think about when it comes to immersion is going into a pool. And what's important about that is that when you go underwater, all of your senses change. Things feel differently. Your sight is different. How the world sounds is different. And that's an important lesson, I think, for creating full virtual reality experiences because you can create worlds that are not photorealistic and are stylized. And as long as they have a consistency unto themselves, then your mind is totally convinced by them, and there's a lot of room for communicating wonderfully um, artistic, gestural, beautiful ideas without having to resort to photorealism. This was created by a friend of mine, Matt Colley, who's in Brooklyn, and he took a painting by Van Gogh called The Night Cafe, and then built out this full world, um, and for those of you who haven't seen this, like, get in a VR headset, it's amazing. And the way that he takes these ideas from Starry Night and the other paintings so that you really feel like you're in this world that Van Gogh created where there's no straight edges and there's these wonderful long brush strokes, um, it's remarkable. And this, this is missing. There's a sensibility to this that is missing in most immersive experiences created today that too often are just trying to mimic um, the real world often to their detriment. Lesson four, we're going more into theater. Stagecraft, that's a thing that exists, and there's a lot that you don't need to reinvent the wheel for um, using some of those lessons. And so there's a company out there right now called The Void that is kind of a go-to uh, site-specific virtual reality experience for a lot of people. There was one here, uh, Ghostbusters and Madame Tussauds. I, I got to go to one in London for Star Wars. And the central idea to this, what separates this from most virtual reality experiences, is that there's a physical environment that you can actually reach out and touch. And of course, anyone who's gotten to touch something in virtual reality and feel it there in the real world, it's such a, a I hate to use the word game changer, but it, it's such a, um, an, a, an immersion multiplier for feeling like you're actually there. And you don't need to have a huge space to make this work. We use this in architecture all the time. So here's a little stagecraft trick similar to that, where we wanted to start to play uh, for this particular theater project, Rice, with how you could put seats in the theater and change where they are and move them around and feel what it's actually like to sit down and move things around. And using a Vive Tracker, which costs about $100, we could hook that up to one of the Eames chairs in our offices. And then wherever you are in the theater, you can kind of grab any seat in front of you and it's always gonna be the same chair in the real world. But then you can start to make some decisions about, you know, maybe we wanna have a seat over here. Maybe we wanna move the seat an inch. And then we can bring all the, yes, sorry. Uh, bring all that data back into uh, virtual reality. Thank you. Back into Revit so it actually affects the design process which is great. And then also what you're seeing here is that we're using uh, virtual reality through this whole project so we could also cycle from older versions of the design into newer ones and check in on that feeling and see how well everything is holding up, which can be great. And great, that's still working. Um, some people, when they start to think about taking this stuff to the next step, which to me is crafting virtual spaces that will never be built in the real world, they think that's an inherently less interesting idea. There's not a lot of real architects or real spatial thinkers like yourselves designing uh, virtual reality domains or projects because a lot of people see it as it's, it's too alien and too different from the real world. And I don't think that's so true, uh, not so much. Because, uh, for example, you know, uh, budget and constraints, for example, in the real world, you're thinking about how much certain materials cost, how they interact with each other, what the budget is going to be for uh, per square foot, um, what's structural, what's going to hold together. And all of those constraints can forge something really exciting in the real world. And the truth is, in a virtual reality experience, there are similar 
budgets and constraints, but they're different. Instead of thinking about uh, the cost per square foot in dollars, you're thinking about the cost per polygon count or the draw calls so that you can maintain a 90 frame per second experience and still make sure that you are communicating a spatial or an architectural idea to the best of your ability. When I used to do um, set design, this was production of Equus uh, in college, you know, a big part of that was figuring out what's the minimum amount you need to show to get across your effect. And of course, you know, this staircase here, this staircase here, when you're sitting in the audience, you have the illusion of a very full space, but as everyone knows, you're not gonna be building out the back of that. You show no more than what you actually need. And you can do something similar inside of any kind of virtual reality or interactive experience where you can basically delete or, or never build in the first place anything that someone isn't going to be experiencing from the inside of the design, which is important. Lesson five of six. Um, architecture phenomenology exists. Um, first thing you gotta do is learn what the heck that word means, and then you use it. So for those who don't know, architecture phenomenology is the notion of how your body reacts to being in a certain kind of space. Uh, and that's something that has, just like stagecraft, a very long history. And so there's some lessons to be learned there. So starting here, who knows who said this quote? Oh, good, good guess, but it's not Thor there. Uh, no, this is Winston Churchill. And he said this after the um, House of Commons was destroyed in the Blitzkrieg because there was a big call for like, we're gonna rebuild it, let's make this room a lot friendlier. Let's all be in a big circle and talk about our feelings and everything's gonna be great. And he was like, no, damn you. Like, I want this to be um, confrontational and I like the ritual of if someone disagrees with someone else, they're gonna cross the aisle. And he wanted it to be built exactly the way it was. And that quote came out of him talking about how the architecture of the space is so important to how people behave in that space and you can't underestimate that. And so thinking about the history of architecture and the way it's affected us, I mean, architecture is such a huge part of how we define ourselves as species and cultures. And if you think about, say, a culture like the Mongolians, we don't know a ton about them, and a part of that is because they were nomadic and they didn't leave behind a lot of architecture, versus Stonehenge, which is 3,000 years old, and uh, Gobeki Tepe, which is 9,000 years old, where we assume that both of these uh, uh, sites have some kind of religious significance, and we can start to uh, find meaning in what these cultures were doing based on their architecture. There's a lot to be thought about there, and so now, when I think about the way certain modern architects talk about the field, I'm always thinking about how this applies in particular to virtual reality experiences, um, immersive environments. So this one from Renzo Piano saying that you, know, you can't fight gravity, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright saying that you, know, you only get one shot at this, it's built, and then you can try to hide stuff, but that's it. And especially potent to me being a theater designer, Rem Kulas being like, yeah, that really sucks that the best shape of a theater is a shoebox, uh, that's kind of boring. But all of these things, not so true in VR, because you can fight gravity, you can iterate on the same project a thousand times if you want to, and you can make the theater look however the hell you want, and make the acoustics exactly what you want as well. Those suddenly become separate design decisions. One more of these, everyone knows the Louis Kahn quote about, you know, you ask the brick what it wants to be, I like an arch. And there's a sense of materiality um, to real objects and how they want to interact with each other. And these are just questions, but I find myself wondering, when you're building an immersive piece of architecture, whether you're simulating brick or any other material, does that actually want to be a certain thing? And it shouldn't be forcing it into any certain mode. That's something just worth pondering. But that all flows, again, there's this idea that you can iterate more and more and get more and more precise because you can have a thousand people go through uh, an immersive experience and see how they responded to it and then change it however you want in a way that you can't in the real world. And then Frank Lloyd Wright, chicken house to a cathedral, both of those kinds of projects can have equal merit, and for anyone who's ever seen the work people do in Minecraft, you can spend a ton of time on either of those kinds of projects, and they can look amazing. I find myself thinking a lot about architects like um, SOM doing this kind of moon colony, Bajark Ingalls is doing Mars stuff. Bajark has said um, at South by Southwest that the reason they're doing stuff in Mars is uh, this notion that he's a little bit bored with the rules of the real world and he's looking for new challenges. And again, it frustrates me that there's so few architects starting to take on the, uh, the challenge of virtual architecture that still needs to respond to the user in certain functions the same way as the real world because there's so many exciting challenges to me there, um, especially once you start getting people using it. Real quick, more on architectural phenomenology. Um, I like to get people thinking about why it is that a cabin in the woods can feel very cozy and safe and how that relates back to being in a cave and again, feeling like a predator is not about to eat you. Similarly, for being very high up in a space and having a great view of your surroundings and what that meant again for safety and having a certain sense 
of uh, dominion over your surroundings and how that still translates into our reptile brain. Similarly, now food does. We still love salty, sugary things because if we had those many, many years ago, that would mean that we weren't going to die over the winter. And we can't really rationalize our, our brains out of still thinking that it's a really good idea to eat a ton of that stuff. Um, even though it's not so good for us now. But I think in architecture, especially virtual architecture, there's some new opportunities that can be hopefully a little bit healthier than the food analogy because your body doesn't really care whether you are in a real space or a virtual space. It's still going to respond with that reptilian sense of predators and whatnot in the same way. Um, Jessica Outlaw, for those of you who don't know, is, is doing some really excellent work with people inside virtual spaces and has looked at things like um, how people will sit down in virtual reality. And people, even in virtual reality, still prefer to be on a perimeter, up against a wall, what some people would call a ninja-proof area where no one can attack you from behind. Uh, because from there, we just feel safer. Even if you're in virtual reality and you're in your own home where you, you're no danger whatsoever, there's still a part of our brain that wants that. So there's a question of how do you translate some of those notions into the are, and I'll show you an example of that in a second. Um, for those who have ever been high up in virtual reality, watch this. Um, that feels incredibly real, and it's terrifying. And there's a positive side to this where you can use virtual reality to get over your fear of heights. Um, but again, your brain is still so convinced that this is real that that's a tool that you have that you can use to your advantage. Um, in a great example of what not to do, I recommend you all check out a wonderful blog called McMansion Hell, which are just examples of terrible, terrible architecture doing terrible, terrible things. And I find that, unfortunately, it's a good analogy for what's happening inside a lot of virtual reality experiences right now, where people are just kind of like, I think this looks cool, well, let's throw this on there. I found a, a, this in a kit bash tutorial, and I'm just putting it in there now. And there's not a lot of uh, reason or logic behind it all. And so in some, I'm not going to show actual examples, because I don't want to embarrass anyone who might be making them, because they're doing it out of the goodness of their heart. But in some of these social VR experiences, a lot of these spaces being created are quite terrible in that McMansion zone of things. Another pop quiz. Who painted this and who is this? It's a self-portrait. Shout it out. This is Picasso, guys. This is Picasso. He painted that when he was 16. And then went on to do some stuff that was more abstract, right? But what I like to show with here is, you know, Picasso didn't jump right into doing crazy abstract stuff. He learned the fundamentals. He studied the masters and became someone who had a, a wonderful understanding of light and shadow. And then, once he knew the rules, he then felt comfortable breaking them. And I think the same thing needs to happen for people who are crafting immersive environments. You can't just jump right into saying, okay, I'm going to throw all these things together and look, I made a virtual reality restaurant. Um, there has to be some studying of what comes before that. Because there's this assumption that inside digital space, you don't actually need architecture. You can have this white room and you need something and it just shows up. But fundamentally, as humans, just going back to the way we've evolved, we need to feel like we are in a, a meaningful space with detail and color and light. And we need to have a sense of where our eyes are going to be guided. And if you don't have that sense of a frame, then the way light and color and space itself starts to guide your attention is more important than ever. Um, this is literally the first time I was ever playing with SketchUp uh, for an early play of mine. But this is an example just of the way our brains react to too much sameness of like, cookie cutter houses all down a row, it can kind of make people go insane, similarly to a blank space. So you know that's the kind of thing we want to try to avoid crafting immersive experiences. Um, as far back as Toy Story, there were artists on Pixar's team whose entire job was just to add grime and little nicks of, of um, things not looking too perfect, because that's a really important thing that registers in our brain, even for a cartoon movie, that if we don't see that kind of stuff, we say something is wrong. And I'm not going to go into this right now, but wabi-sabi is a Japanese art form, you could say, that's all about finding beauty and imperfection and impermanence. And I'd love to talk about that for half an hour, but just know that it exists. And um, here's a, a book list for you guys. I've got three slides of these, and I'm happy to send them to you. But going back to the Picasso thing of learning the fundamentals of what you need to learn for your craft, there's a lot of wonderful books that cover architectural phenomenology and how to build. And I don't agree with a lot of this stuff, uh, for example, but I think it's important to learn these things. And then you can respond to them, and you can react to them, and you can build your case against them. 
more here. Again, I'm happy to send these. And then this one is actually primarily about video games and the way we design environments to have a certain level of interactivity. But through all this kind of research, you can start to build your own philosophy. But I warn everyone against doing anything that follows these rules too closely because it can lead to bad results. That's not actually what happened. This is an artist's rendition. But for those who don't know, the Little Savoy, which is supposed to be this you know, perfect pinnacle of architecture, was kind of a terrible place to live. And it almost killed the three-year-old boy who was living there because of the roof leaking and the mold and other problems with just the fundamental design of the space. Similar stuff has happened with, say, Peter Eisenman buildings with you know, columns going through stairs and that sort of thing. So when you get too much into the world of sculpture and some idea that you haven't had a chance to user test the way you can with virtual reality, uh, some bad things can happen. Last uh, thing I want to talk about here is something that's missing a lot of times in virtual reality is that sense of the context of what's around you and how you got there. So I love the Sistine Chapel and part of what made the experience so magical for me in person was everything that happened before the Sistine Chapel, progressing through all these galleries where I saw all these paintings that were mind blowing and I can't tell you anything about them now because the moment I opened from those tight little galleries into the Sistine Chapel, like coming out of a forest into a wide open space, this took my breath away and obviously no picture can capture it, but the, the mastery of light and detail and dimension to this is truly breathtaking. And there's not a lot of that in virtual reality. A lot of times in the virtual reality experience, you plop in and you don't know how you got there, you don't know what you're supposed to do, you don't know what's interactive and what isn't. And really the only time in the real world that something like that happens is if you're kidnapped. And I don't think that's a great way for anyone to experience virtual reality. Um, we really want to onboard people and give them a sense of how they should um, behave in a space. And there's a lot of ways to go about that. I want to show you one example here of a piece of virtual reality architecture that I think works really well. And it's unfortunate that you can only see this in 2D. I want to put you guys in the space. But uh, Mike Murdoch, who's the art director of VR Chat, starts off all of his spaces with kind of like a dressing room experience. So you know, you come in, you change into an avatar that's a little bit more suited to that particular space. And there's certain things he's doing with light and color and the way he guides you. Uh, your eye and how, how you move through the space that's really smart and very specific to virtual reality. Now, this is an example that uh, is really taking advantage of the way people respond to real world architecture that shouldn't translate to VR, but for now, until we're 20 years in the future with more of an established language, it works. So the chairs on the cocktail table, you see a chair in virtual reality, you're gonna sit in it and you can click on the chair and then you sit in it and you're kind of locked there. This happens a lot with theaters as well, even though in the real world you might still be standing. And the cocktail table thing, if you saw a version of this space with a lot of people in there, people gather around cocktail tables. No one in virtual reality is having a real drink, but still, when a bunch of people are in this space, they gather around the cocktail tables. So it's just, again, using that psychology of how we operate inside spaces. Last lesson is when you can design inside of virtual reality, you should, and not to say that you should actually do your blueprints and all of your fine detail work in there, that's exhausting and terrible, but anytime you can actually be inside a virtual reality or augmented reality if you're at the actual site and pull all of that together, um, it's really amazing. This is a napkin sketch, guys. This is the kind of thing where this is supposed to sell the idea of a project. And uh, you get down to this kind of party level scheme of what it's going to be, and that's supposed to be something that can really represent the core idea of the project. But virtual reality has this wonderful opportunity where you can do the spatial equivalent of a napkin sketch where you are not prescribing wall thickness or light or any kind of detail yet, but then you can let people walk through the experience and still have things like a sense of compression and release and what it's like to move from one space to another. And you can have uh, you know, people in there as well, which is really exciting, especially if you do a multi-user experience. And no one is really doing this right now, despite um, how much more useful that is than that. So in this example, you know, this was a project where we had a tilt first sketch, we brought it into Unreal Engine, we're using the VR editor, which is wonderful, and starting to mass out a lot of different ideas for light and color, and just how it felt to be inside of certain spaces, and then making those decisions into uh, Revit, into 3ds Max, and so what you're seeing there, for example, the white there and the pink there, is the sketch as kind of a 3D underlay as the more precise versions of everything are built out. So you can be in that sketch mode where everything's very gestural and then have the precise version back in your DCC program of choice. It's kind of like working with trace paper, right? Except in that three-dimensional <coughs> um, Again, just some other modes of that. Set design, it's really cool to uh, mass out a design for uh, a project inside virtual reality on a virtual stage that's at the right scale. And then as you'll see in a second, taking that and dropping it in um, the actual theater that it's, it's actually <coughs> when it starts doing productions. 
is pretty exciting. If you're going to be doing something like a traditional 2D animation, you can do that inside virtual reality and lay out the camera the same way that a lot of directors are now in film and actually figure out exactly what's going to be the best way to tell a 2D cinematic using virtual reality because you actually feel like you're in the space shooting on location. Um, in this case, this is just changing the railing design and actually grabbing elements of the railing and pushing and pulling them so that once that um, you've made up your mind about like, okay, this feels right and it's within code, which are certain constraints we put in there, again, that can go back into what ultimately will be the construction drawings. And then saying we're still looking at Rice, that project you saw is like just very diagrammatic. As the project progressed further along, we wanted to think more about light and color and how it felt to be in that space as some of these really big changes were taking place. And then we could start to uh, pick our five favorites, for example, and then put different clients, users, collaborators into the VR model and see how that felt and let them make up their mind about what their favorites were. And then, again, from there, you can start to still crank out traditional 2D representations. These are some V-Ray <laughs> renderings we got out of the VR model, um, which is, is helpful for useful communication. <coughs> but if you spend all of your time in VR and you've seen it progress um, across all these different stages, then it's really exciting when the project is actually under construction and there's a lot fewer change orders because everyone has been there and everyone has seen the project develop over time and no one is being surprised by what they're seeing now. That's a wonderful thing. And so, just really quickly, you know, if people haven't had that kind of experience, dumb things happen. And these are real things that have happened with some of uh, our projects at FDA, where people see certain annotations and do terrible, terrible things. So that's, that's how you get change orders. I spent $10 on that stock photo, and I think it was worth it. Uh, last thing, this is my last slide, is so now I've got kind of this sandbox where I'm always playing with these ideas and thinking actively about what an ideal immersive experience is like. And so I, I went into designing this with the knowledge that this will never be a real project, it will always exist in virtual reality. I sketched it out in Tilt Brush, and then the idea was taking this sketch, um, which I was able to experience, you know, at that human scale spatial level, and then bring it into Unreal Engine where I then masked it out, played with different lighting, played with different materials, and started to think about what it would actually be like to occupy that space and spend time there with other people. Maybe I want to get a friend who I haven't seen since elementary school and just sit down and enjoy the artificial sound of the water and the trees. And believe it or not, it's a really relaxing space to be in as we play with different options um, for what people like best. Again, you can do a lot of user testing. And then I can also set up certain things like you know changing the furniture very quickly. Um, we can start to place things and have a real physics environment. And uh, then again, just thinking about things that you can't do in the real world, uh, but you can do in virtual reality, is destroy it. <laughs> so this is something I play with as well. Where we actually do this for all of our Arc Busy projects right now, where there's like a button on the keyboard we can press, and it's basically like, turn real physics on, and then things can get wet, and things can catch fire, and you can destroy everything. And I find, honestly, for a lot of designers, this is such a, uh, a stress release <laughs> to be like, working with the project. Uh, and yeah, I'm going to leave you guys with that madness. Uh, oh, and last thing too, and again, I'm happy to send you this slide. This is just a diagram of some of the programs out there that let you actively design inside virtual reality. Some of them are multi-user, some of them focus on drawing or sculpting or both. And um, I want to see more people playing with these, so happy to talk more about that. These are the lessons we talked about. Here's a nice quote I'd like to leave you with about just what an exciting time it is to be a designer thinking spatially. And um, yeah, I hope you guys start to um, tried some of the stuff, talk to me about it. If there's a project we can collaborate on, that's always exciting. And thanks to all these people who influenced this in one way or another. And thank you for listening. Thank you, Alex. That was awesome. Thank you. That was one more time for Alex. Yeah.